Okay, we're in. All right, the Vikings in their vessels or things we think we know. Um, Cece and I have been doing this for fi over 50 years now. So we might have learned a few things, but we've learned enough to know that we don't know some of the things we think we know. Okay, a blessing and a curse. In Norway, but of course, at the turn of the late 19th, early 20th century, they discovered two wonderful vessels, the Gokstad and the Oseberg ship. They were almost completely intact. They were preserved in blue clay. Everybody thought this was it. They had found the legendary Viking ship. Before that, you had some picture stones. You had the Bayou Tapestry. And yeah, not a lot. But having found these two ships, everybody assumed that these are typical Viking ships. Um, obviously, you know, we've got them. They're Norwegian. That doesn't hurt. And they were able to uh, reconstruct them very well. And everybody sort of seized on that. And that became the Viking ship which indeed they were, but they were sort of an intermediate class of Viking ships. They were cars. They were not the big warships like you, you hear about Harold uh, uh, Fairhair and all, uh, the, the really large ones. And they weren't the small coastal raiding ships. These were medium sized. And especially when you come to the Oseberg ship, think of it it's not a warship, it's a royal yacht. It's for comfortably transiting the coast. And the net effect is if the only two ships that were found for the 20th century were the RMS Titanic and the KMS Bismarck. If those were the only two ships that we found from the 20th century, well, 20th century ships looked like this. Look, we've got a merchantman, we've got a warship. They all looked like that. Uh, what about submarines? Uh, what? Uh, aircraft carriers? Huh? Destroyers? What? No, they all looked like that. Well, yeah. How could we possibly get into trouble? So this is what they look like restored. They don't look alike, but, you know, we've got good restorations. By the way, as, as my friend Fred Blunder is fond of pointing out, uh, one of the stacks on the Titanic is fake. But it just looked so cool with four stacks. The other one just had, you know, piping and plumbing and, and auxiliary stuff. But it looks cool. So what wasn't addressed by these two ships is smaller ships and larger ships. Um, the one on the left, the Ralswick Rugen II, is the one that we base several of our vessels on. And you can see where it's got a knee holding a thwart, and then the frame, the lower frame, which is also called a rib by some folks. Uh, whereas on the Gokstad ship, it's a little more elaborate, but it's basically the same system. But where we're sitting, on our frame that on our thwart that comes across, their floor is basically the deck. Technical jargon. So just to confuse things, they call the deck the floor. But you wouldn't call the deck the floor otherwise. And then you get other ships where you have a much more elaborate cross section. This is called Love Three from uh, Skodlov Fjord in, in Denmark, Ralswig. Uh, no, Skodlov. And once again, you see these very narrow thwarts. And now you've got an extra level there. So this is the written in stone cross section. OK, so this is how you would row this boat. And on the carves, uh, other vessels are me measured by how many thwarts they have or how many frames. They're measured by men at the oar. And this 
for all we know, they might have been standing. But this seems to work because they found a sea chest, which was just right for rowing. And ever since then, they've built endless, endless replicas of the Gokstad ship because that's the more seaworthy one. I think they've built exactly two replicas of the more beautiful Oseberg ship. Uh, this was built in 1949 to commemorate the landing of Hengist and Horsa in England and to thank the English for helping the, uh, the Danes uh, repel the, uh, the Germans after World War II. Um, one, one note for seamanship, they built this wonderful figurehead on there and it weighed 600 pounds and the whole bow sort of mushed down in any sort of a seaway. So you're, you're sort of cruising along with, uh, with sort of a, a scary low down bow as the waves come breaking towards you. Okay, so everybody's going to sit on chests. Uh, this is the one and only Oseberg chest that everybody reproduces, but there's several chests that were found on the Oseberg ship. Now, these ships are taking about 30 rowers. So you would have had maybe 30 chests. And, you know, if you're the younger son, the third son of the farmer up the fjord, he's going to make you a chest. Right, Dad? Yeah? Uh, so I can go with them? Uh? Um, our theory is that they might not have used chests. Uh, on the on this vessel, the uh, the Hugen, they discovered first of all they asked the rowing club to crew it, and the rowing club was all modern rowing, you know, with the sliding seats and all of that. And they all discovered they didn't have any leg room, so they pulled off the backs of all the chests and pulled off the bottom and put a rung across where they could put their feet so they could row as they were used to rowing with their legs stretched out. So this was a case of making the ship or at least the chest fit you as opposed to making you fit the accommodations in the ship. On the Harold Fairhair, they took the Gokstad ship and they made it bigger. They basically just blew it up and made it bigger and higher and longer and bigger and creating the longest Viking ship in modern history. <laughs> and they can barely row it. I mean, they, they blew up the ship, but they didn't blow up the people. Uh, it was like uh, the, the example when the, uh, when the Manx wanted a Viking ship, they made a two-third scale replica of the Gokstad ship but they didn't have any two-thirds scale people, okay? If you could get little bitty people, it would row better. So this is sort of the, the slavish copying. Once you have a really cool vessel, everybody wants that really cool vessel. And the Norwegians had two of the coolest. Yeah, tyranny of scale. Yeah. Oh, the sail. Uh, that sail is probably twice as big as, and the mast is huge. E everything just got expanded tremendously, and uh, uh, several of our people were privileged to drop by and, and take a look at it and go, go aboard it when it came to America. But it's just too much, too much. The sail looks like it's going to just topple the thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they had it reefed a lot of the time. Okay. It yourself. Here he is. I, I have a question. Um, uh, you, uh, the, the Bayou Tapestry shows that part of the Viking ships were painted. I, is there any other evidence that shows that some of the Viking ships were painted other than the Bayou Tapestry? When we ended up in Dublin this year, I think they had some strakes that were painted. I'll, I'll have to look at my... Uh, um, mumble. Uh, my book that I bought at the Dublin Museum. Um, also, some of the Gokstad picture stones show uh, some interesting striping along the straits. 
Okay. All right. Just wondering. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a um, question. Uh, it, uh, some of the pictures I've seen show uh, shields uh, on a Viking ship. Now, was it the custom of warriors to put their shields on the outside as a method of intimidation or decoration? Uh, it's not just a method of decoration and intimidation, but also it's convenience except in very heavy weather, putting your shields outboard is great because it declutters the ship. And these ships are really cluttered when you start hauling all of your gear on board. So not only that, but they also go serve uh, to protect you from spray and such too. And just about every vessel uh, that's a warship has some sort of arrangement for hanging the shields. The uh, Oseberg had a little, a little substrate where you could deposit the shield, each one in a little slot. And the uh, Gokstad ship had uh, a little rail inboard with, uh, with teeth on it that you could lash your shield to. Okay, so um, it's, it's very convenient to have them outboard. It's very cluttered to have them inboard. If, if you get real heavy weather, you might pull them inboard. But outside of that, uh, you would you would keep them outboard just for convenience. I have a question. You mentioned that the um, the dragon head on that one ship was so heavy that it brought the whole front downward. Yes. Presumably, you wouldn't do that on a. They wouldn't have done that on a real old Viking ship. But did they have the dragon heads? And do we know how they made them lighter? If they did. Yes, they, they had the dragon's head. There's, there's a lot of evidence on coins and picture stones and such, not to mention the Bayou uh, comic book, as we sometimes refer to it. But um, we found that if you b make it proportional, if you don't get carried away and come up with, you know, I've got the biggest head in the fleet, um, anything that's proportional works out fairly well. So this was just an example of uh, one person designing the ship and the other person designing the head and a lesson well learned. So one, one of the reasons you do experimental archaeology is to find out what works, what doesn't, and why. Thank you. You're welcome.